make money out of selling, buying and selling Russian art, but also I'm a whistleblower for the monumental quantity of fakes that are on the Russian art market. Anyway, my career began rather as Tacey's father did at an absurdly expensive private school, and I went to Bristol University, and in 1985, I went to the Soviet Union for the first time. So I studied in Minsk, and then in Pitygorsk. This was on a Russian uh, history of our joint office. Uh, you probably don't know a great deal about the Soviet Union, but it involved all kinds of nefarious black market dealings. You sold the Scorpions with the best band in the Soviet Union at the time. We lived on the 13th floor of an obstetricia with no lift, usual hard luck story. The shots, as you probably do know, were absolutely empty of anything except, I remember rightly, smoked mackerel. Uh, then in 1907 I joined Sotheby's, and in 2012 Sotheby's did an exhibition of my collection at their Moscow office. So I have a private gallery in London, and that's what it looks like on the inside. I've given pictures to all these exhibitions over the years, so the Vrubel exhibition is uh, 1996, the most <coughs> recent is 2018, which is the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich, when I gave some pictures from my collection to uh, for public exhibitions. So I always give pictures from my collection whenever asked to do so. Uh, bizarrely, I'm also in the Encyclopedia of Rusko Vagangada, so there's a little bit about me there. These are exhibitions that I've done in the last 10, 15 years. They primarily concentrate on the Russian avant-garde, which, as we will discover, is the most, um, how do you say, sportable, um, controversial area of uh, art, probably on the world market. Okay, these are TFAP exhibitions. TFAP is the European Fine Art Fair, where I've been exhibiting since 2015. Proud to say the only dealer in Russian art who does uh, deal with this, because it has a very strict betting committee. That's my last exhibition, Soviet Pyrenees, that was in London. It closed in January. Uh, these were architectural drawings and theoretical drawings by an absolutely brilliant artist, uh, Chernikov. Now, these are some of the places I've exhibited at. So, Moscow, but bizarrely in Arkansas last year, uh, Tretyakov Gallery in 2014, um, Arkansas is absurd, but it has a wonderful collection of Russian art. God knows how or where, but they got it. Uh, so these are some of the places I've lectured at. These are some of the organisations that I belong to. The only reason I'm busy blowing my own trumpet is to give some idea of, that I do have some credibility to say what I'm about to say. I was also on the BBC, Fatal Fortune. That was a gopping fake by Chagall, uh, which they managed to create an entire programme around, which was completely ridiculous, because you only had to look at it to see that it wasn't by Chagall. And the Chagall committee took, you know, said that it was wrong, and then there's a huge argument that blew up as to whether the picture should be destroyed or not. Okay, now the disclaimer, the reason this is in here is because there are people out in the Western world called lawyers, and lawyers have a really irritating habit of the moment you say something's fake, they jump down your throat and they serve you with every paper under the sun and you don't know what to do next. So, lie. there are no fakes in this lecture. The decision as to whether these fake are pictures that I'm going to show you or not, are, it's your decision as to whether these pictures are fake or not. They've got nothing to do with me, so you all get sued. Uh, right, now, in the arts newspaper back in, I think it's February, I wrote a piece about authentication of Russian art. Okay, so if a picture is recognised by the leading auction houses, the leading art dealers, and the leading museums, then it isn't a problematic picture, it's a genuine picture. If, however, it is not recognised by those three institutions, you've got a problem. Right? Now, I'm afraid to say this lecture does involve audience participation, <laughs> because the question I wish to ask you is, are these two pictures painted by the same painter? Hands up who thinks they are painted by the same artist. 100% hit rate. This is fantastic. You are utterly brilliant, all of you. Right, I'm not going to tell you whether they are or not until a little bit later. Are these two pictures painted by the same artist? No. Someone thinks they are. The great thing is freedom of speech is alive and well. And it's permitted at lectures. 
Okay, you think those two are painted by the same artist? Okay. Do you think those two pictures are painted by the same artist? I've got to tell you, these are crap pictures, I'm really sorry. It's just theoretical, so you think they are. Anyone else? We're looking at about a sort of 97% thinking no. And do you think these two pictures are painted by the same person? Long ago, look at you. Do you think these are painted by the same person? Anyone? No. No? Okay. Do you think these two are painted by the same person? The answers will be revealed later on in our programme tonight. <laughs> right. Now, about uh, two years ago, there was a big case of Rothko's. So Rothko's had been produced industrially at Fez. And a huge uh, uh, court case took place in the United States. And one of the people who was asked uh, to, to come in and give evidence was a lady called Martha Parrish. And Martha Parrish was the president of the Society, the Association of American Art Dealers. In my experience, art dealers are much better people to ask about authenticity than our museum people or academics because we, we, all of us, have a financial interest. So if you're about to bung tens of thousands of pounds at a picture, you better be damn sure it's genuine. An academic doesn't have that responsibility. In France they do. What? France they do. In France they do? Yeah. If you're, uh, if you're an academic, uh you have to carry a huge responsibility, so that's why it's impossible almost to get from a French museum person. Hmm. You I have to say this, I'm going to offer a tiny bit of evidence that might okay. suggest otherwise, okay. but you, I'm sure you're it's right. It's master paintings, old masters. Um, no, no, old masters, masters, possibly. Not in the Avalon of Gala, I don't think. But old master paintings, that's, um, that's why you never want the French expert anymore. Well, I mean, don't buy, a French, don't buy an old master at a French <laughs> auction, would be my advice. I'm really sorry. Anyway. The Association of Art Dealers America, what Martha Parrish said in, re in, in reference to these pictures by Rothko, she said that if a picture is below market price, you should be suspicious. If it doesn't have an established provenance, you want to investigate it. If you're offered a whole collection of work sharing these kind of issues, you're not going to touch it, which is exactly what happened with all these Rothkos. So Rothkos appeared by the 10, they're all much cheaper than the market. Price. They haven't got an established provenance. So she then said, in a case such as this, what are you going to do? You're going to run like hell. Because there's no way the three criteria that I spoke about earlier, the yeah. auction houses, the museums, the dealers, they're not going to touch these pictures. Because you've got no resale value later on. So it's a huge can of worms. Now, in the Russian world, it's even worse. To the point that we have two markets for Russian art. We've got the one where the major London and New York auction houses, the major museums are the leading dealers, where we've got another market, which is the minor European auction houses, no major museums, and no leading dealers. Right? But there are two markets that exist. And by way of a comparison as to why market two is best avoided, is this particular example. Uh, this is a picture by Ilya Chashnik, incredibly rare artist, avant-gardist on the right, Nikolai Sweetin on the left. Now, you have here a full provenance, which you can incidentally check. You have exhibition history, you have literature. So it's actually in books, it's been exhibited publicly, and it has a provable provenance. Here, you have another one, which has got the best provenance you can have in the Russian art world, which is Kostakis. The Kostakis collection was legendary. The man was a complete genius. He hoovered up every single great work of Russian avant-garde that he could from 1948 on. So with that kind of provenance, that picture's got to be genuine. But at the same time, it's got a thing called a certificate of authenticity by a gentleman, and I use the term very loosely, called Alexander Azarmatsev. Okay. Now, you're going to be the judge here, not me. Okay, that's pre-sale, that's your chashnik. Okay, it's 12 to 15,000 euros, and it's got this fantastic provenance and Mr. Azamat's certificate. However, three or four days before the sale, the Kostakis family rang up the auction house and said, this picture was never in my father's collection, and unless you take it out of your sale, or take that information out of your sale, the lawyers are going to be down. So, of course, they had to take the provenance out. Okay. 
but you still got Mr. Azarmatsev's certificate of authenticity. Now, at the same sale was a, another chassis, an oil, right? 18 to 20,000 pounds a euro uh, uh, estimate, with another certificate from our good buddy, Mr. Azarmatsev. That's a watercolour by Chashin, all right? With a full provenance, full exhibition history. And the important thing is that that's an oil, that's 18 to 20, that's a watercolour. The watercolour's 120,000 to 150,000 euros. That's 18 to 20. So what is that telling you? That's already you're in the sort of, hmm, it's too cheap. You're going back to what that American lady Martha Parrish said that this price is too low. So let's examine Buddy Azarmatsev's certificate. Okay, this is, sorry, this is the watercolour. This is what um, materials we had to support the problems of this picture. And here's Mr. Azarmatsev's certificate. Okay, unsold, didn't sell, thank God, for 18,000. That sold for 200,000 euros. So that's what the difference between a proper provenance, exhibition history, and all that junk, has over a picture which only has a certificate by Mr. Azamadza. But again, here we go, go back to the American Art Dealers Association. These are the four criteria which the picture on the right clearly fulfills. But the picture on the left, you're going to be running like hell. When you're offered that, you're going to judge. I don't want the lawyers coming to visit. You're going to be the judge. So pre-sale, I knew I didn't like this picture, but I was keen to know who this guy Mr. Azamadza was. What is he? What's the basis for what he's saying? So, I asked, who was the owner? A French dealer. And before that, an American journalist who knew the artist. This is the auction house answer, right? How is that possible? Who exactly, between what dates? This is to establish provenance, which is what Mark Parrish says you must do. I don't know. The paintings have a certificate from Mr. Azarmatza. Surely all's well. Is Mr. Azarmatza reckoned by Sundays and Christie's? I don't know the policy is of your competitors. If you look <laughs> On the internet, you'll find Mr. Azarmatsev is a well-known uh, art expert. Okay? But this is me asking the questions. So surely as the son, you want to be 100% sure that what you're selling is the real McCoy. Mr. Azarmatsev guarantees the authenticity. That's good enough for us. Right. So then I asked the journalist to find out who the hell Mr. Azarmatsev was. And all we got was, we had no record of him in his Paris address. He was apparently supposed to guarantee authenticity, but he then answered post-sale that he did not guarantee authenticity. He wasn't competent. <laughs> Christ, another relative. It wasn't for my relatives, it was for the smallest audience. <laughs> um, the number three mention of, we went into the internet, to find out who Mr. Zermatsa was. He's the first mentor, the head of computer simulation at Tambor State University, and then he's also a drummer with the rock group Bearing Straight. We still haven't found who this guy is, okay? We then go for the Russian version, so the Cyrillic. The first up we come up is an ice hockey player, so this well-known art historian. There's no sign of this guy on the internet. It was only on page two that we discovered that there was this marvelous Moscow art historian, in an article by Patricia Reming, who, as you will discover, I love like a brother, just not one of mine. And she is the president of an organization called Incorn. I asked a journalist to contact Incorn to ask the credentials of Mr. Azarmatsev. Answer came there none. Okay, now, Mr. Azarmatsev, bless his little heart has been on the offensive since I last gave this lecture, and he's made a couple of outrageous claims that I gave a lecture in Moscow, at which the questions were, shall we say, on the difficult side, and I stormed out. Interesting one. At the same time, or slightly previous to that, Mrs. Rayling, to whom we'd made inquiries about who is this Azamatsa, came up with this little gem. She made an announcement on her website that there is a certain individual in London who sells my Russian work of art who has been hired by a tycoon who rewards him every time he declares a work to be fake. That's me, by the way. 
Now we're going to come into the meat that is in corn, which is a group set up. It's called the International Confederation of Russian Russian Modernism, or words to that effect. And they were set up in 2007. This is how it looks like on their website. Okay? So they include amongst their members cosmologists, which of course are critical in the authentication of any work of art. And we'll be dealing with a number of members of INCORN and how they've authenticated pictures that are not fake, they are dubious at Weber. And we will have a look at what they've done. Right now, this is their code of practice. Okay, you've got to recognize the artistic uh, origins, nature. So basically, your job as a member of INCORN is to uh, explain why something is either authentic or not authentic. That's their part of their code of practice. Particular line you should pay attention to is recognize the anomalies that would preclude a work of art being given <laughs> to a particular artist. Now, here is one of the examples of an in-corn certificate of expertise. It's not the actual certificate, but it's one it's a picture that they have certified. Here is a picture by my favorite artist, Alexander Bogomolov, from 1917, showed at the Toulouse Museum in 1993 and 1991 in Kiev, unsigned. Pictures that are signed and unsigned are critical in the authentication of pictures because 99 times out of 100 in the avant-garde, they're not signed. But when the picture is dubious, they're almost always signed. It's very bizarre. Anyway, so as according to the Inkle mission statement, we have to determine the place of the work, the artist's known body of work, establish the adherence. First of all, it's not an English sentence because it repeats the word work. But I'm going to ask you, are those really painted by the same artist? I mean, in all conscience, are these painted by the same artist? It's signable. Because I've been dealing with Bogomars almost exclusively now for five years, and I really cannot see any similarity between those two pictures. Now, that picture appeared in this particular book, The Morphology of Russian um, Non-Objectivism. Okay, and this was written by five members of beloved Inkle. Now, quite interesting, because what they did was the people then, this is a 2003 book, so it's about 16 years old, and all the people working for Inkle at the time were actually working in the museum structure in Russia. And what they did was they took pictures from the museum collections in Russia, which have no questions regarding authenticity at all. They are 100% and everybody knows it. And in, within the pages, they then interspersed pictures with no provenance, no exhibition history at all. And beside each picture, they also put detailed explanations as to what the picture was. Now, they didn't do that with the genuine pictures from the museum. So you've got to ask yourself, why did they do it? Why are they promoting these pictures but not these that are in museums collections. All right. Now, in the pages, there was another book on Mars. So, exactly the same uh, problems on the left, and this <sighs> recognize anomalies that preclude the work being attributed to a given artist. Okay, well, if you're going to recognize the anomalies between two particular works of art, I mean, for God's sake, <laughs> you know, my daughter could recognize the difference between those two. I mean, it's just, it doesn't strike me as the, I don't, I mean, I don't know how many of you are art historians or studying history of art, but I mean, in all conscience, are these really painted by the same bloody artist as claimed in this book? Right, so two markets. Now, the most interesting, of course, because it's money, is the most interesting of all. Now, here you have a recent sale, May the 15th, 2018. This was Kasimir Malievich's Supremacism. 89 million big ones for a work with a staggering provenance, exhibition history, you name it. Sold in New York. Okay, here's one that was on sale at exactly the same time in Brussels. And it's auction house? Brew, the Brew sale it's called. I think they closed down since. And of course, there is no provenance, there is no exhibition history, but what there is, is we've got certificates of expertise from one, two, three, four, five, six members of INCOR, but we've got an estimate of 80,000 euros. 
How is this possible? It must be worth 8 million to 10 million euros. Minimum. So, there you've got the result. Sold for 89 mil, unsold at 80,000 euros. How is this possible? Again, at the same sale the year before, a man image with no problem. Well, it's got completely uh, bogus problems. But it's got certificates from one, two, three, four, five members of Incor. It's sold for 67,000. Well, again, let's compare it with a picture with a provenance and exhibition history that sold at exactly the same time. And actually, that was an oil list of watch. This sold for three million dollars. So there's a kind of a bit of a dichotomy going on here. You've got 67,000 euros, three million dollars. There they are, parked together. It looks funny. And then, of course, you read the small print of the Bruce sale, which says that we take no responsibility whatsoever for the authentication, uh, for authenticating pictures. Okay, so Turk says it here. The organiser makes no warranty as to the accuracy of the statement of the author, i.e. it could be Joe Bloggs, doesn't matter. The origin, so <laughs> where it came from, the date, the age, the attribution, the problems. In other words, what they're selling is nothing. They're not selling you a picture by an artist. They're selling something which they're then going to deny because it's in their small print. And if I go there and I say, well, hang on a second, but this picture isn't recognised by some of these. They go read the small print. And they've got every right to because that's what it says in the small print. So why, therefore, are Incorn giving certificates to these pictures? I've then got a journalist to contact them. And this is the quote they came back with. If you want it to be different, it would be preferable for you to buy at Christie's or Sotheby's. Well, it doesn't give you a great deal of confidence in Incorn or in the Bruce So avoid it like the play. Now the best way to spot Russian art, and whether it's not whether it's dubious or not, is the old mince pies, because here you have an example of a picture by Alexander Exter, brilliant um, avant-gardist from Kiev. And if you look at the way the paint's sitting on the canvas, I mean, I promise you, spotting a, a, a duff picture is dead easy. I promise you, it's literally two seconds. The paint is sitting differently. The paint on the picture without, that has no questions, is sitting in the canvas itself. Here it's sitting on the canvas. Right? And the other thing is someone's been over it with a blowtorch. So, as a result of which the paint surface has cracked to give it a sort of a, a, a sort of lure of authenticity. You've got it here as well, this is the Vinci Ormus, the bicyclist. You've got a dubious one on the right and a, and a, a absolute masterpiece on the left. It's quite interesting to see how the paint actually sits. Here again, it's sitting on the canvas, here it's embedded in the canvas. It's a big, big difference. Now the biggest scandal regarding Russian art, and Natasha Monsharova, Here's your French art historian. All right, so that's a monograph. She only managed to get one out before the explosion took place. But that's Denise Bassetou's monograph on uh, Binchon. So 2010, 2011, two books on Goncharova were produced. And it is a fact that Goncharova painted pre-1915 300 oils. It's a fact, because she made a list. And a list exists, the yeah, whatever. The list exists. And yet, in our French friend's book, there are 460. Okay, so now we need to look at some of the examples of where did these pictures come from. Well, here you've got, this is in the state Tresikov gallery, and this figure looks like a chicken which has got some nuclear disease, is uh, in Denise Bazatou's book. So purely on just looking at the damn thing, there's something not quite right. Okay? Now this is a quote from a uh, Russian art historian. This is not the real Italian Vincerova. This is the thought up Vincerova, one that never existed. Fake. Okay? Now, the point here is this has got no provenance at all. This has got a vast provenance and exhibition history stretching back years. This is other pictures in Mrs. Bazatou or in Dr. Parton's book. There were two books, Dr. Parton's 2010. Denise Bassett, of 2011, I wrote to Parton's publishers before the book came out and said, there will be a monster scandal if this book comes out. So in Anthony Parton's book, this picture appears as genuine. 
And yet experts from the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow, where the largest collection of Goncharova, came and viewed the picture and said, <coughs> it's not by Goncharova. So what's it doing in Parton's book? Another example. These are two pictures, the wrestlers by Goncharova. But in Mr. Parton, Dr. Parton's book, there's a third example. All right? So again, you've got this Provence, private collection. That is a meaningless Provence. It's not a Provence. You have Provence is a name of somebody or an institution. It's got no exhibition history. But it's in Dr. Parton's book. And then absurdly, he puts in the source of that picture. So he didn't just put in the bloody picture. He put in the source of where he thought the picture came from. And even if that picture is genuine, <coughs> You know, I mean, it's pretty shoddy work, to be honest with you, to start putting two pictures. This is clearly the source of that. Goncharova wouldn't have done that in a million years. She had an incredible imagination. I think we'll soon see. Anyway, again, I don't want the lawyers visiting. You tell me if you think that's right or not. Now, one thing that, we, with Mrs. Bazitou and her book, was that, Goncharova, who's this incredibly original artist, as you will discover, because at the October there's an exhibition of her work at the Tate, and she is an extraordinary visionary and uh, revolutionary artist. And Irina Bakar, who's one of the leading experts on Goncharova at the Tresikov Gallery, famously said her contemporaries were struck by the diversity of all that enriched her and she hardly ever repeated a composition. So, so original was she. But, <coughs> This is the original, this is Cyclist in the Russian Museum, and remember those words, she hardly ever repeated a composition. 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 The bloody push bike was founded in the year 2000 but they're all in Mrs. Bazitou's book. Hold on. And the only one that hasn't got anything, shall we say, dubious about it is, of course, Lucy Kist. Here, catalog number 770, which has got provenance, exhibition history, you name it. Now, it is faintly amusing that that happens, but the trouble is that, of course, they then escape through onto the market. And this is a sale in 2013 in Paris, of a Goncharova. So it's a lot of money for somebody to spend to then be told by a leading museum, a leading dealer, or a leading auction house that it isn't right. 800 to 1 million euros. If it had had a full provenance, full exhibition history, you're looking at 6 to 8 minimum. Right, now, of course, the signature, this is, I mentioned this earlier, you virtually never have signatures on pictures of the Russian avant-garde. All these are signed to say nothing of the Bogomazovs that I showed you earlier. It's this sort of classic mistake that people who produce these pictures seem to make, that they're almost always signed. Now, with the connection, in connection to the Goncharova scandal, because the Russians went nuts, the uh, Russian sort of art dealers federation invited Mrs. Raven of Incorn and Dr. Parton and Mrs. Basitou to Russia, all expenses paid, to come and discuss their books and why Mrs. Raven was protecting them. But as usual, answer came there none. I don't know why, but they never answered. Now, by order of the Russian courts, June 2016, the sale and distribution of Dr. Parton's book is now a federal crime. That's how nuts the Russians went. Because quite rightly, they saw it as a serious attack and an extremely insulting attack on a tremendous artist. If we, um, somebody gave a brilliant parallel, which was if somebody started, you know, if suddenly 200 turners appeared on the Western market, it's kind of faintly insulting because it's not humanly possible. And it's a bit of an insult to the artist himself. And that is actually a point that a couple of very distinguished critics, um, uh, or museum directors in Russia made, was that it's a terrible attack on the heritage of a truly great artist. Anyway, it's now a federal crime 
I don't think there's a single book in that I can think of, art book, which is actually, it's now banned. The distribution and sale of this picture is banned. Again, you be the judge. Now let's go back to Martha, uh, Martha Parrish. Those are the criteria. No, below market price, you're not going to touch it. No provenance, you want to investigate it. Offer the collection sharing these characteristics. Again, you're not going to touch it. You're going to run like hell if you're offered a picture like that. Okay, now, the latest scandals bringing you right up to date with the latest fun and games on the Russian art front is Ghent. Bloody Ghent. Ghent, an uh, exhibition in October 2017 of Russian avant-garde of 24 pictures opened up in the Ghent Museum of Fine Arts. There was no announcement on the internet. There was no catalogue. Nothing. But the museum director may well go down in history for uttering the most famous last words that she intended to rewrite the history of the Russian avant-garde. <laughs> she sure did that. <laughs> now, I have to be a little bit careful because there is an ongoing, shall we say, legal situation. But the collective value of this collection of 24 pictures was about 300 million US. And it included, this was just extraordinary, Kandinsky, and it included Yevlyansky. Now, on the 15th of January, a joint letter was signed by four serious academics, one of whom is Vivian Varna. Now, if you have a Kandinsky or you've got a Yevlyansky, the person you go to is Vivian Varna. But Vivian is also extremely wary of giving her opinion. We're all wary of it because of aggressive lawyers. But for her to sign a letter saying that these pictures are dubious was an extraordinary uh, step and an incredibly brave one. Konstantin Akinsha, curator of Russian modernism at the Neue Gallery, Natasha Murray, the Royal Academy Show of Revolution, which a lot of you may have seen. Sasha Shatsky is well known as the world's leading expert on Mainich. Okay, They were backed up by a series of top level deals. Richard Nagy, Ida Bracker, Alex Luckman, Ingrid Hutton, some nameless git, uh, <laughs> Julian Barron, and Jacques de la Herodia. Now the reason we included Jacques in this was Jacques actually went to this, the owner's house and saw the pictures. Then the arts newspaper took over. All right, so we wrote this letter. We got screamed at, shouted by, by the museum director, by the owner, but the arts newspaper did an expose, and this is what they said. Starting with the first picture, top left. It's quite clear that this picture isn't even close to Philonov, said the deputy director of the Russian Museum, who just happens to have 95% of Philonov's herb in her collection. And to fake Philonov is almost impossible. And if that picture was genuine, I couldn't even begin to put a price on it because there's never, there's only been one oil by Philon on the market. And one that's that big, it's tens of millions. The guy was a complete genius. Right, Kenneth Archer, who wrote Rarick East and West, said, it doesn't rather suspect to me. These are all academics. They're nervous of saying anything, you know, particularly controversial. But what's the point to make here is that this view of the Himalayas, there isn't a single picture by Rarick showing the Himalayas before 1924, and yet this one's painted 1922. How is this possible? Then you go on. This, Rosanova. Okay, it features Rosanova. I've seen one oil in 35 years of being. Okay, it features a scarlet 25 copex uh, stamp on the back of it with a prescription post of the Russian Empire, but his head never appeared on the 25 copex stamp. So, again, what is going on here? What is this? What are we dealing with? And then, of course, two Lusitskis. Now, Willem van Renders, curator of Russian art in the Van Allen Museum, which has versions of these pictures by Lusitsky, with full provenance, with full exhibition history, etc., etc. These two works, supposedly by Lusitsky, was only two well-known crown pictures in the collection of Van Allen Museum. But there's no historic record of these pictures ever having been produced. Lusitsky's an incredibly rare artist. Why were they never published? Further claims by the owners of the pictures was that 
Toporovsky was the owner of the pictures, said that he acquired pieces formerly in the Joseph Orbelli collection. No, he didn't. Because Orbelli's daughter-in-law said that Orbelli never had a collection, and he didn't even have a bloody house to live in. So how on earth did he acquire these masterpieces of the Russian avant-garde? Then, his wife said that she knew, or her father knew, the great Russian art collector, George Kostakis. Aliki Kostakis didn't say that. She said something completely different. She said she'd never heard of Olga Toporovska. Doesn't mean they didn't meet, but it does give rise to a certain degree of, shall we say, doubt. Then, finally, Olga Toporovska said she was related. This is the wife of the owner. She was related to Naum Garbo, the great sculptor, originally Pevsner, and had bought paintings from his collection. Nina Williams said she'd never heard of her, and that Garbo never had a collection. Garbo escaped from Russia, Soviet Russia, in 1921 with nothing. He didn't have a collection. Okay. Now, the other claim that was made by the owner was that he'd acquired these pictures on a salary of £36,000 per annum, because Russian art at the time was incredibly cheap. So I went back into my archives and I looked at some of the pictures that I dealt in at that particular time and what they cost. Well, I mean, you know, Bogomazov, okay, this was a big picture, 150,000. 10,000 for a work on, by Rudchenko, work on paper. 18,000 for Alexander Volkov, again, Bogomazov, 35,000. 20,000, 1994, he's not telling the truth. He can't be because all of these pictures went through my hands at some point in the early 90s, and they're all Rodchenko apart, second-tier artists. So even, he couldn't have afforded even the second-tier artists to say nothing of the top-tier artists on a salary of £36,000 a year. Now, the really interesting thing about the Toporovsky collection was he offered one piece of evidence to a journalist to support the authenticity of his pictures. And that was this exhibition catalog. Except he doctored it. So, as you can see, the picture, the catalog of the 1992 exhibition, which he claimed his pictures were shown at, and there's the doctored version. So what he did is he photoshopped his pictures there and there onto into a catalogue. Now, it was probably this piece of information that also, but this, this exhibition took place in 1998. He said it took place in 1992. The pictures were shown in the wrong section. They were published with false inventory numbers. And there were nine spelling and grammar mistakes, and the Queen of Hearts, which is also in Mr. Toporowski's collection, was translated as the Queen of Worms. This is pretty shoddy stuff. But this was one of his, the only piece of evidence he offered to support the authenticity of his pictures. So when that piece of information came out, the exhibition was closed down. And an independent commission was sent in to investigate these 24 pictures. But when they arrived to start their work, there were four people, okay, there were distinguished art historians among them, and when they arrived, they were denied access by lawyers acting for the museum director and the owner. They weren't allowed in, they weren't allowed to do their work. 5th of March, huge expose again, because one of the other pieces of evidence that the museum director offered was that these pictures had all been okayed by two very distinguished art historians, Nathaniel Dabrowski and Naomi Smolly, except that when they actually bothered to ask these two art historians, they both said, no, we didn't. One of them actually said, it's all fake. And the other one said, you don't walk into a house filled with works of that period, like hundreds of millions of dollars, and ask, where do they, you know, you've got to ask, where do they come from? March the 7th, the director was suspended. Exhibition closed down. Pictures seized by the, German, the Belgian police. However, on the 18th of October, the fight back began. And the Mrs. de Zeger accused us, uh, or the group, us as a group of people, of mendacious allegations. There's no solution. And she got a letter signed to the eternal shame of the 60 people who signed it. 
supporting her and saying she'd been a victim, that new word which we all love and hear just about every single day. And amongst the things that I was so angry when I saw this letter that I contacted one of the signatories and said, you think these pictures are genuine, don't you? She went, no, no, no. We're not discussing whether the pictures are genuine or not. There's nothing in our letter of support to say these pictures are genuine. So I said, well, what do you do? She said, well, I think you should contact respected our you know, experts of the Russian avant-garde. Well, who to contact on Kandinsky and Lublevsky? Vivian Barnett. So I asked her, who is the world's leading expert? Who wrote the catalogue resume? Who is the recognised goddess on this? As usual, I got no answer. Okay, but at this press conference, Mrs. De Zega said that she's going to prove, material, offer material proof, good for her, that 10 of the pictures are genuine, as seen by European laboratories for material technical research. They gave no details about which materials, wood, oil, whatever, but it doesn't matter. Nor were the names of the labs disclosed. But help is at hand, because riding into the sunset will be bloody in call, and I can tell you that there will be certificates of expertise before they've even come from somebody connected to Incor, the same group that puts authenticates pictures at a thousandth of their value at sales in Brussels. Okay? 26, we're right up to date now. 26 of January 2009, the city of Ghent. Positive criminal fact that against the Zayn and Toporowski for creating false documents. So the contracts that they signed between one another appear to have been post dated. All right. Then there was a complaint about against the newspapers about the victimisation of this woman. It was declared null and, null and void. So this whole Ghent case is now reaching a crescendo. Now I've got to discuss the bloody certificate of chemical expertise which Mrs. De Zager is now going to come and produce as material proof that all her pictures are completely genuine. I hate these things. Now, this is one that I have, which belongs to a lovely, lovely client of mine. She is of a certain age. She wants to leave her pictures to her son. She asked me to come and value her pictures for me. She bought a clue. It cost her 400,000 Swiss francs. That's a lot of money. That's 350, 350,000 pounds. And in this certificate of authenticity by Dr. Elizabeth Yeagers and Dr. Erhard Yeagers, who coincidentally are both members of INCOR, uh, we have a confirmation that this picture is by Ivan Kuhn. All right? Now, first thing, if this was by Ivan Kuhn and had a provenance, an exhibition history, all the, the bells and whistles, you're talking even today 10 million, 15 million. There aren't any. They just don't exist, but Dr. Yeagers has said that this works by clue. Okay, now, with a certificate of chemical expertise, you must have pigment samples from by paintings by a particular artist that are beyond, beyond uh, uh, dispute. You have to have something to compare with. You can't just say, it's by clue. You've got to have an example of why it's by clue. So here's a genuine clue. These are the pigment samples. This is the paint he used. This is the... the a cracker you only use, this is the varnish you use. All that has to be in there. But the Russian Admiral Guard has got no such database. So how can you say it's by clue when you don't have a database to which to refer where you're painted? Chemical expertise, which instead runs to tens of pages, not three, can only prove date. Now, at Mrs. Dezaga's press conference, she had a pop at me. And she had a pop at me because there was an exhibition on... Uh, Russian avant-garde in Mantua, that well-known hotspot of Russian uh, non-objective painting. And in the press came the following comment from the head of the 20th century, uh, 20th century works on paper. I've only seen the capital, not the exhibition itself, but it is abundantly clear that every exhibition at this, excuse, every picture at this exhibition is fake. Okay, well that was the provenance they came up with. Okay, those are what the provenance is, that's what the, oh, the, the organisers said was the problem. Precious relics saved from a shipwreck. Now you know why I asked you the question, are these painted by the same person? Because that was at Mantua. Okay. That is 
hanging up in the Tretikoff Gallery. That was in Mantua. That is, unless I'm mistaken, in the Museum of Nizhny Novgorod. Okay, so just comparing, that's why I asked your opinion of were these pictures painted by the same person? Then the absolute mm, gem. How do you spell commune? This was a picture <laughs> at Mantua, and this is a picture in the Russian Museum. Now, you can all tell, I think, by the reaction, that commune has got two M's in it. But in the picture in bloody Mantua, it hasn't. You see, and it is amusing. It's so infantile and pathetic that it's amusing. But I got sued, and I didn't like being sued. It's horrible being sued. And there's a quote in a book that's just come out um, called The Dark Side of the Boom, in which I'm quoted as saying, people really think that by suing you, they're going to make their picture genuine. And it's absolutely true. How the hell can that picture be genuine when they can't even spell the damn thing properly? Anyway, I got sued. That was fun. Um, now, the latest other mega scandal is that in Wiesbaden, this was a really important case uh, in March 2018, the Times announced, as only the Times can, that art dealers, three billion fakes are the real thing, and isn't that marvellous? And he's got 1,800 pictures of the Russian avant-garde, and they're all genuine. Isn't it fantastic? Because it's been declared by a court. Okay, well, The Guardian, not noted for their lack of hyperbole, wrote something else, which was that the forgery case ends in convictions and disappointments. Because they hoped, we'd hoped, we'd all hoped, that of the only 19 pictures that were on trial, that the whole lot would get savaged by a judge. Okay? Sadly, only three of them got savaged by a judge. So the truth of the matter is that the two gallery owners were sentenced to three years, 32 months, and fined one million euros for knowingly having produced fake pictures by Anisitsky, Malich, and Rodgin. Right. Well, according to the Rosal of a Center in Vladimir, and Authentication in Art in the Hague, in Corn, was founded by Mr. Zarug and Mr. Hazaz, who were the manager and managing director of SNZ Galleries. So that's the latest, if you like, piece of information. And according to the German police, in Corn received 10% of the sale of every single picture that went through their books. I'm not saying they're fake, but I'm saying something's not right. Now, according to the people who seek to uh, sort of shut us up, these pictures all disappeared in the Stalinist repressions. They were hidden under Granny's bed or some such nonsense. And they, what they really love is it's a massive conspiracy. They're all out to get us. And this letter was sent out, this circular letter <coughs> was sent out to leading dealers of Western European art. And as I'm on this list, I was found it pretty objectionable. So this is a letter, unsigned, which accuses myself and Peter Arvin, who's a well-known oligarch, plus everybody who signed the letter against Ghent. It accuses us of, hang on, we're missing a slide. Help. Ah, right. The accusations that they make is we're controlling the market and experts by fear. This is me, by the way. Uh, manipulating the market for our own benefit. Yeah, right. Uh, dictating what the major auction houses are allowed to sell. I mean, this is kids' stuff. It's like my going to Sotheby's and going, you know that fake I showed you, you're going to have to put it in your auction, or else. <laughs> and they're going to say, okay, or else. Because they are a decent organisation, they're a professional organisation. Forgery of provenance, oh, steady, giving false authentication. This is what we're being accused of. And those who refuse to join get attacked and bad morphed. We don't know who wrote this, but somebody said we got bad morphed by Arvin, the oligarch and his people. And they accused us of setting up this sort of cult called Arvin's people. And our job is to manipulate the market and lie to our teeth and so on and so forth. However, thank God, they set up a rival organisation and it is called Get the Arvins. So their avowed aim is to overturn centuries of art history centuries of art market knowledge 
and to prove that their pictures are genuine. Now, you remember the Mark of Parrish gold rules. Okay? Be suspicious if that's getting one of the Run like hell when you're offered these pictures. The Butterwick golden rules are, if a work is unacceptable to the leading auction houses, leading art dealers, leading museums, go back to the loins and run like hell. Thank you for listening. Subsequent to that, loads of Russians got involved and signed and said, this is appalling and this is this and this is that. But as far as the da your database is concerned, it's incredibly important. They've just started to do one in Russia, very, very slowly, a book's come out. Mm -hmm. And that gives some paint samples. But one of the reasons that, in my opinion, God, I hate when I say that, uh, that the museum director and the owner of the pictures did not allow the independent commission in was because uh, there's been a very interesting case recently. I was, there was a picture coming up at a Paris auction and it was not right. And I wrote and told them. And I told them why it wasn't right. And they ignored me, ignored me, ignored me. So I then wrote a week before the auction, I said, can I release our correspondence to the press? At which point they went, no, you can't. We'll go and investigate the picture. And do you know what they did? They took the gonsha over to the Pompidou. They took a tiny paint sample, the Pompidou yeah. gave it, and they were able to work out in seconds. Yeah. And I didn't say it was a fake. They wrote back and said, thank you, it was a fake. Yeah. So it's what's needed, and it's, we're getting to that stage. But I promise you, you don't need chemical analysis to work out that these pictures are, unless I'm absolutely wrong, and God help me if I am, is that these are painted post-war. And that this is the absurdity of the chemical certificate anyway. Why I hate it so much is because it cannot prove authorship unless, as you quite rightly said, you've got the database of the paint used by the author in the first place. Oh, I should do my part. <laughs> in the search for right. <laughs>
that's something else that's going to come up sooner or later. Because there has to be some, possibly there are particles of the artist yeah, somewhere exactly, in the canvas. Exactly, yeah. you know, I mean, I, funny enough, I'm great in favour of this, is that the more advanced it becomes, the better. It's getting, if this was the Western art market, I think people would be talking using, or talking about using dinner. But because it's this bollocks story about, you know, Granny hiding a picture in the KGB, you know, Chagall had given her, oh, come on, ducky, give us a break. Mm -hmm. It never mm -hmm. happened. Oh, that's not true. There is one picture in the tape. There's a marvellous Chagall of portrait with a, self-portrait with, with a, a palette. And it's a big, elongated picture. And that was found under somebody's mm -hmm. bed. But the problem was then, of course, uh, when <laughs> the person who sold it found out how much it was worth in reality, he went nuts and it's got huge ownership problems. But, uh, just to continue your comment, but with Chinese art, for example, there are stories of kind of a new dynasty race being found in some Grand Arctic and so on, but just because of different material, different... I don't know. I don't, look, first of all, the, you're talking about Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty lasted for a great deal longer than the Russian Avant Garde. <laughs> the, 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 um, if you're talking about non-objective pictures, so the pictures that we're dealing with here are primarily, you know, geometric pictures. And uh, the period of geometric art in Russia, I don't know, Black Square was painted in 1915. You know, and then it was banned by the Communist Party in 1932. So it's all in first version. You've got a 15-year period, probably even less, when it's being painted. So I think DNA... I, I, I don't think it's necessary with all this. For example, everybody knows that you know, George Kostakis, in the case of Kuhn, went into Kuhn's studio, wherever it was, 19, the 50s, the 60s, said to Mrs. Kuhn, Kuhn's widow, I'll take the lot. <laughs> Who did the lot up? Whole blinking lot. And the only way it can be, you know, Kuhn can be a clue is if it's come through George's uh, family or George's. So I'm not sure you know, DNA is going to be necessary, but it's a welcome as well. I mean, uh, I, I'm not a specialist, but I, I kind of was reading about the um, Tibetan Tankas and certain masters, uh, they were just put in the back of their fingers. Brilliant way of doing it. Yeah, they've yeah, always been much more advanced, yeah. than, sorry to say, than the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Russians didn't think they were getting it. You know, dragged through the mud by a bunch of you know um, of, of discredited experts. It's a bit much to say that you can't find something. So the cobra painter Oscar Young, you, I think it was it was two hundred that was found in his brother's um, attic, who has never bothered looking up because Oscar Young would go and use his brother's house. So when he died. And he had never, nobody sort of thought when Asker Young died to have a look at it, and now they did the brother, and then he died, and the family had to clean it. We stood there, I said, I don't know better. What is all this about? <laughs> yeah, we've come off it, that's very much the exception to the rule. No, no, but it's, so it can't, but, and that's a pretty major artist. I mean, he sells, I mean, I'm a dangerous, because of course we're a proud of our cover artists, but still, I mean, they sell for, for millions as well. They gave them all to the museum, so it didn't affect the market, actually. Well, that was good, too. Because that's what we're being accused of. Yeah. One of the things we're being accused of, which is just so utterly absurd, is that we're accused of market manipulation by the guy who wrote the ambiguous, uh, anonymous letter. We're being accused of market manipulation in order to keep Peter Arvin's collection of pictures higher. What's well, such bollocks? I would give my eye teeth for these pictures to be genuine. I really would, because I haven't got anything to sell. Because there is no Russian avant garde to sell them. That's what I love, and that's what I'm interested in. No one sells, no pictures made. So, it, it, but believe me, uh, our Russian friends will agree with me here that there is no nation on earth that is better at finding things out very, very, very quickly and then hoovering it all up very, very quickly than the Russians are brilliant at it. Furthermore, there are some incredibly competent dealers in Russia. Really brilliant ones. You know, real top, top dealers. How does the Hermitage react to these things? Do they get involved? Well, but funny yeah. enough, we got Piotrowski to say something about Ghent. Yeah. Uh, he didn't say 
quite what we'd hoped he'd say, but he did sort of slightly say, oh, come on, this is absurd. But it was to do with Orbelli, because Orbelli was formerly the director or curator of the Hermitage, you see, and one, one of the sources of the Ghent picture. I mean, I think Ghent's a really interesting benchmark, because if, a, God help me, if it comes, it, you know, they get prosecuted, then, first of all, the good thing is they'll have to shut, they've got to shut in court. I'm still seeing their certificates even today. And, you know, what am I supposed to say? You know, I'll get bullied, I get bullied, I get threatened, I get this, I get that. But I don't quite know what I'm supposed to say. I can't accept your picture. Very sorry. But the Hamsters were never used to. No. Anything. God, no. I would dream of it. I mean, the trouble is, well, it's actually, you know, you're not as far from the truth as you think. The trouble is, a lot of these in-court experts are former Hammersmith creators. Former Tretti Pop ones. They're formerly Zdarsky, Zdarsky, and Shane Warren. Mm -hmm. So, one of them's trying to um, rehabilitate. <laughs> and, um, but there are several Tretti Pop experts. And that's why. They, all of them, lost their jobs during the previous regime, which was under Irina Nikolaeva. But the current regime isn't sufficiently proactive in exposing this kind of thing. So when we, I mean, the reason Ghent got exposed was because a Russian artist on Facebook went in to see the Ghent triptych, you know, the Van Eyck adoration, oh. and went, you are joking, aren't you? This is a, just a Russian artist, and he went on Facebook and went nuts and said, it's all fake, it's all this, and the other. It's a treachery property, told me. So I went to see the exhibition, photographed it, blah, 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 blah. And it was only the genius of my wife who told me, when I got home, she said, for God's sake, don't rip up your entrance ticket. And I thought, what the fuck are you talking about? You mad. I did. Because, of course, it came to pass that when we wrote this letter, it all went nuts. The Zaga said, nobody warned me. I had my entrance ticket. I'd written to her saying, I must come and talk to you about your exhibition. Because you really can't show me stuff. She refused to answer. Her assistant sent me a letter. And then she denied anybody had been to see the exhibition. And thanks to you, I, I kept my ticket. So I was able to prove. But the funny thing was I went with a colleague who was over 65. And they asked the question was, well, why is the ticket one of the tickets half price. Because there were two tickets, one full price, one half price. My friend was a pensioner, so he went in half price. But it was just sort of mind blowing. But I think it's the key case. I really do. For Russian Adam Art, it's the key case. And I think it will, I'm hoping it will work out. And how has it been taken? So I normally live in Brussels. Uh, as far as I am asking you about Ah, Brussels. Yeah. Well, there's a reason. I think there's a reason why Mr. Toporowski picked Brussels. Belgium for his collection to be housed. Because you have got some nutty laws there. Well, you have some interesting auction houses, but they tend to be very careful. They tend to write school off, period off. Well, this lot, don't uh, uh, Studio off. I, tend, I mean, if it's not a real thing. Well, you saw the Brew uh, yeah. Sales Hall print, as it yeah. says. We take no responsibility for. Well, then you wouldn't have found a uh, Gator Ringo down. Oh, no, good Lord. No. No, 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 certainly not. There's some bright Belgian dealers. Oh. I mean, you know, they all surface on the TFAP in March. You know, yeah. I mean, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that, uh, TFAP's marvellous. It's this sort of coming together of Europe, yeah. all the European dealers, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Like, you're right. Yeah. But, you know, the, but there it is. It's printed in black and white. These pictures are not necessarily by who we say they're by. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? You've still got the will to live. <laughs> You. <laughs> well, look, thank you very much, and thanks so much for, for coming. And I'm, I'm sorry, I hope it wasn't too long. I did say an hour. Yeah. Um, thank you very much indeed for listening. Yeah. Um,